Imagine wearing that. Yeah. <laughs> That's the thing you think. You think, oh, it's not that heavy. Douche. Yes, it is. Oh, this one is now, this, this is eighty pound. This is stronger than I can draw. I only draw about thirty. Pounds. But this is a baby for the period. The heaviest one we found is two hundred and fifty pounds. So that means it takes 250 pounds of force to draw it all the way back, and it sends away that 250 pounds of force through these arrows. So having this really, really fine point at the tip, all that force is going straight through that tip and straight through your armor. So these little ones are arrow holes. So apart from maximum damage, what's this uh, one for? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this one's a film myself, hook. But, uh, so this started off as an agricultural yeah. tool. Um, so yeah. we can sharpen this point Actually, here a bunch of really and made this a nice point. And we can use it to harvest our wheat quite this easily. Um, and if we've got rabbits, rats, that kind of thing in the field, we stab with our point, ah. there's the rabbit. rabbit. Now, once we get into battle, we, we have to the ones with long sticks pie. like this. And, you know, peasants with muskets suddenly make running around in really heavy armor okay. a really bad idea. Yeah. Because they can just shoot through it, so you may as well not wear as much. Okay. So, after about 1500, <laughs> gauntlets and, and particularly the armor on the extremity starts to go away. Right. Um, what what era is this helmet? So that's a baboot. Um, I believe they're from about 13th century. Okay. Um, they are an evolution of, uh, well, that's, they're, they're part of the same family, I believe, as the um, these guys here, mm -hmm. um, the bassinets. Yeah. So this becomes a design that is very, very common with a few variations all the way through um, Western Europe. Mm -hmm. um, there's fairly distinctive hound skull um, face pieces and visors on it like that. Mm -hmm. There's more sort of flat. This is, I think this is an earlier version. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, you can see the helmet shape itself is yeah. more or less the same. What changes is the neck protection and the visor. Um, then we, you get to a stage where you're wearing one of these uh, with something over the top of that mm -hmm. for the initial sort of charge as, right. you, as you go <laughs> screaming in a battle on the back of your very uh, long-suffering horse. Yes. Um, you've got this, you have very little um, line of sight, you have very little vision, mm -hmm. but you have very good protection. Okay. So as soon as you're past that initial smash, you mm -hmm. can whip that off and get something that is um, right. a little bit easier to see through. Okay, what about this one? So that's another bassinet. So that's, I think, an earlier period bassinet. This one, um, it's got a sort of a hinged visor, so you can actually unpin this and yeah. flap it open. Mm -hmm. um, and again, so that would be probably an underhelm for something a bit, a bit bigger and heavier. For which country? Uh, these pop up. Um, the English are wearing them. The uh, Germans, the French, um, all kind of slightly different variations on these, mm -hmm. uh, and the Italians as well are on these. Okay, um, so and then this yeah, one, cool. this is looks yeah. that World War I. One. That's, yeah, I, th I think someone's put that there on the table, I'm sure the story is there. Okay. But this one's a, um, one you see a lot in the Italian context, I believe, as well. Uh-huh. Um, in that sort of era when the, all the Italian city-states are going, Italy, Italy's not a thing, there's only, you know, Venice and Rome, and we're all at war with each other. Oh, um, right, okay. So, they're, there's, um, they're either fighting for... Um, or an alliance with other European powers against each other, or vice versa. Uh -huh. um, and there's a lot of these things that pop up. These are a great trade-off in terms of protection versus visibility. Right. Really good for your sort of average foot soldiers who don't have to be wearing, you know, impervious armor over their whole body. Right. They just need something to, you know, stop an arrow from. Them. Oh, it, going them. And is this the pad that you wear under the helmet? Yeah. So that's an arming cap. That's a, just a quilted uh, bit of soft padding. Uh -huh. So you would have something that's probably fairly tailored um, to your the head, head shape um, that would sit underneath, that. underneath it. Okay. Yeah. Yes. And also have a suspension liner. So there's a sort of a ring of leather that suspends the helmet up off your head. So the whole weight of the helmet is not actually Isn't pressing on you. pressing on the neck. And then what is this one? That, I believe. I'm not sure what the story of this particular one is. I believe it's in the same family as, as this guy here. Ah, okay, because it looks like a um, Anzac hat, except metal. It does, does a little bit, doesn't if, it? Yeah. If one side was bent up. <laughs> yeah. So it's sort of almost got that Akubra. Yeah, it, lo it looks like a regular hat and not a 
helmet. So yeah. thing, but it's wow. Well, this yeah, stuff. Yeah, I can't speak to that one. Um, I believe somebody in the um, in this reenactment club has put that out there because it's a you know an example of what a reenactor can make. Ah, okay. Sure. That's cool. Are you guys reenactors? Well? Yeah, yeah. So reenactors, proper reenactors. So all the time period. Uh, so the stuff we do, and indeed the stuff in this cauldron, represents what would be about 10th century Byzantium. Okay. Um, so the head, or oh, well, not the head, cap <laughs> of the uh, Holy Roman Stephen Empire in this period of time. Uh, Constantinople, I refuse to acknowledge Istanbul. So our, our, our group is actually based on an actual mercenary group back in Byzantium. Oh, well, well. The Varangian Guard. So they were, were pretty much mercenaries. mercenaries for hire from all around Europe, which is why if you look at all of us, we're all dressed That's what differently. Say, all, all, very all of us are dressed differently. So, for example, I'm a Swedish Viking. Mm -hmm. Dan is a Alanic. Alanic. Yes. Paul is, I don't know, Paul is something. Byzantine. Paul is Paul. Is Paul. We are an Paul actual Paul. Byzantine here. Yeah, that's why no one likes it. Paul is Paul. Um, no, we, like, we're all different areas. Yeah. You can stab but me. Because it, it was like they were all mercenaries for hire. It was just a dream. So, what era of Vikings do you guys we're, represent? We're in 10th century. 10th mostly, century? Yeah, mostly in York, in England. Ah, okay. I didn't know there were Vikings in England. Oh, yes, yes. They, they settled, a lot of them settled there. Yeah, especially oh. in the north, uh, the north part of England and the east coast. Is this a weaver thing? What is yeah, it? It's a loom. It, it's a very simplified Viking loom. Mm -hmm. So, they, they call it tablet weaving because these are called tablets. Yeah. And it depends on how many of these cards, the tablets you have, how they're threaded, and how they're turned. Next to that. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's why you've got all the different patterns. Right. Oh, this is beautiful. Everything you do. Yeah, well, this is for us to keep us hydrated and Wow. Chainmail could never. Well, all you, you do, you need a dowel mm -hmm. and you make a framework, which is usually just very wrapping cord wire around a card or something. Mm -hmm. And depending on how many loops you have, it makes the denser thing. So the less loops you have, the finer it is, uh, open, more open. And then once you got, you know, you just start the wire, just just loop it around one of the loops. Yep. When it's on the dowel, and then uh, I show you. So th this is the the last stitch that was done. Mm -hmm. So you want to do another stitch, and where the two cross over, mm -hmm. you just put the thread, the wire through, so it's behind those two threads, and then you just pull. Oh That's wow, it. I love and that. Then, and then once you've got it long enough, <laughs> see this this morning, they were the same. And the, re the reason why they've changed is because they went through, I put it through a droplet. Oh wow. And you, you start off at the biggest hole and then you keep going. So I got down to five, I think it was. Uh huh. So, um, depending on how tight, and that's how you got that those checks. Wow! So that's all you need is a piece of dowel, a draw plate, and wire. And wire? Yes. Oh, good to know. Yes. Yeah, so you make necklaces, bracelets.
given copious amounts of alcohol as yeah. as Hollywood would tell us is the practice, it wasn't because what happens to drunk people? Some drunks can become violent. If they're violent, that's not going to be good when I've sharp, got a sharp instrument around or, and they're flopping around everywhere with that. The other thing is the alcohol reduces the, uh, well, makes the blood flow um, smoothly so you'll bleed quicker. You could also, do as the lady suggested, start to succumb to shock because of the alcohol in your blood and start to pass out, go into a coma, die, and stop breathing. The heart stops, and I'm working on the dead person. It's a waste of your effort. So we don't like this copious amount of alcohol that they suggest would be used. Um, you might get a dram if you're a bit nervous at the start, and there are lots of records, particularly from the um, Napoleonic Wars, where they talk about the officers sitting there while their leg is amputated, and I'm talking about being amputated in a seated position mostly. And um, as opposed to laying down, uh, they would do that on a ship because of the low ceiling heights and other things. But um, you'd be sitting there, and um, there is actually a great YouTube from a guy who retired to acid surgeon, and he's a surgeon for a reenactment group in England, 33rd Regiment of Foot. He's a surgeon, so he got together with the BBC and they actually did an amputation as a real amputation. And halfway through, I'm going. Because uh, it was that realistic. The, the props people did a, an outstanding job. But anyway, um, so basically, we didn't want you drunk. We didn't want you, we want you awake. And these officers would, would be recorded taking it as a gentleman. Because it would be a sign of weakness if they scream or cry or call for mother. And even soldiers in this era, or that a Scots Highlander doesn't want an ex-Highlander to think you're a weak mother. You know, um, so you would not scream out, you would not complain, and you would just get it over with and get it done. And a lot of people with compound fractures of the bones asked for amputation. That wasn't forced on them because life afterwards without amputating a compound or a fracture is murder. I've read an account recently of a young sailor, 17, fell from the mast of a ship, broke his lower leg and bent it behind himself, uh, behind his back, and um, it was all floppy. Um, he went to the uh, doctor in Copenhagen and the surgeon said, take it off. He said no. Well, he survived for 30 years. And by the time he died, he was agonised in pain. The limb was virtually useless. He, um, he couldn't walk without crutches. He had pain his entire life. And as he got older, pieces and fragments of bone would work their way to the surface and have to be removed or get infected. Um, so the option really wasn't an option. Best course of action, best diagnosis is amputation. Guys, <laughs> <laughs> oh. 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 oh.